it's still a few, okay, we'll, we'll talk about it. So I assume that you're using something like ES6 or something like that, right? Okay, you use transpilers. Okay, how many of you just write JavaScript without transpilers? Okay, and you still enjoy it? It's, it's hard to enjoy JavaScript. <laughs> no, I tried it, seriously, but no, <laughs> that doesn't work. Okay. So, my name is uh, Vagni. Uh, I am heading a small consulting uh, company called Tarka Labs. Uh, we do web and mobile development. Uh, so, I have, I mean, I write a lot of JavaScript, and uh, I've been using ESX a lot these days. Uh, before that, I did a little bit of coffee script and I mean, anything that would not let me write JavaScript but still write JavaScript, I would take that actually. So my journey into functional programming languages came uh, through uh, Lisp actually. So I started off with Scheme uh, very early on and then I did Common Lisp and then uh, I discovered Clojure and so on and so forth. And finally, I discovered that, you know what? Even if you have to write JavaScript, you don't have to write JavaScript, actually. So thanks to transpilers and so on and so forth. So I, my journey with functional programming properly started with, I would say, Clojure and Clojure Script, actually. Now, uh, the thing that I liked really about uh, Clojure and Clojure Script is that it was on the JVM. Uh, I mean, I was a Java programmer, so I, all the libraries were just uh, interop away or they had excellent wrappers over everything. And uh, they also had Clojure Script after a while. And the best thing that ever happened to Clojure Script was David Nolan, actually. So he, uh, he created Ohm. And uh, he, I think this uh, Bodil had given a talk called uh, Developing for the Browser in the Post-FRP World, as if there was some sort of an apocalyptic thing. But uh, that is very true, because after Ohm came in, uh, it kind of gave this perspective of how you could use functional programming and immutable data structures and still have a very, I mean, very well-reasoned uh, user interface, very well written. And from that point on, I started discovering more languages like that. I actually uh, had a brief sojourn with Elm as well. And then uh, Elm is very nice, but at the same time, uh, Elm is, uh, what do you say? I mean, it, it, it's still evolving, and there is a, it, it is very opinionated on the kind of things that you can do with its type system and so on and so forth. It is, it is pretty, pretty nice. But, uh, and then I discovered pure script, which is uh, far more stricter, far more, uh, what do you say, uh, uh, elegant form of uh, functional program, uh, strongly typed functional programming language targeting the browser, right? So usually as programmers, the first thing you do uh, when you do that is you write hello world, right? Or hello pure script. Now, the, the trouble with writing hello world in languages like Haskell is that there is this thing called the IO monad, or this has a side effect. So uh, just to clarify, how many of you actually, I mean, have done functional programming, like, or understand it well? Uh, a few, okay. So just to give a very brief thing, right? Now, uh, the thing about purely functional programming languages is that when you have a function, uh, it needs to be referentially transparent. Like, for example, you can't say, I mean, in JavaScript, you can say var a equals 5, and then you can change your mind and say var a equals 6. Or you can really change your mind and say var a, or a equals hello, right? I mean, you could, you could not only change the value, but completely even change the type and the representation of the whole variable. In uh, functional programming languages, in general, uh, that is generally frowned upon, right? So you do not, although Clojure supports it, you can actually rebind vars and so on and so forth. Uh, in Haskell and other languages, it is not possible actually to do that. Uh, so the same is with, pro with, uh, with pure script and languages like that. The idea is that you don't want to have side effects in your code. So whenever you execute a piece of code, you want to be, I mean, it needs to have a defined input. And as long as it has a defined input, it should always have a defined output, right? Now, but I mean, given the state of where the world is, it, it is not always possible, right? Because you want to be able to print things to the screen or go out and fetch, uh, you know, stuff from the internet, from a web service, or actually make changes to the world around you. And that's the whole point of writing these programs. So if you're only doing purely functional programming languages without any side effects, all you would see is the box getting hot, as uh, Simon Peter just says. There, there won't be any other things. And that would be the only side effect of it. So the idea of functional programming languages like uh, Haskell and PureScript and MLSS 
to separate uh, the purely functional bits from the bits where you are mutating things or where you are changing things or where it has side effects. Now, uh, that's why you have a module here and you have this main function. And the main function just says log uh, uh, hello pure script, right? And it just writes it to the log. But you have to see the do block in there. So do block basically says that, hey, this main function is going to have a side effect. And the kind of side effect that it's going to have is something that prints to the console, actually. So I just put it out there. We will uh, see what side effects are. We'll see what pure functions are and so on and so forth. But I just wanted to say that that is, in essence, the difference between uh, you know, imperative programming languages and functional programming languages is, is the insistence on purity. Just a little bit about PureScript. It was created by this guy called Phil Freeman. It was very hard to find a photo of this guy, actually. Uh, so, yeah, I just stole it from his Twitter thing. He's a fast study one on Twitter and GitHub. Uh, so the thing is that I think uh, given all the other Haskell-ish compiled to JavaScript things out there, like Fay, like GHCJS and all this, I think PureScript is uh, a much better and much cleaner implementation of uh, such a programming language than anything else. Um, and I mean, like I said, I already mentioned I do a lot of uh, JavaScript. But I also do mobile. Uh, so in my day-to-day -day thing, I don't use pure script. Uh, I would like to. I would like to use Haskell, but I don't use Haskell. Uh, so whatever I say, please take it with a grain of salt and other things. So I don't have like the uh, production you know, war marks in my chest or whatever, right? So that, uh, Tanmay is going to speak next. He's going to talk from 34 cross. So he's, he's going to say what happens when you put Haskell in production. But yeah, um, that's about all the slides I had, actually. So we'll jump to code, I think. So let me. So let me know if you're able to see this. Uh, it's supposed to be pink and all that, but um, yeah. anyway, so let me do one thing. Let me just change it to a white background. Maybe it'll look a little better then. Okay, it, it, it's okay. It's workable. So let's not let's not worry too much about it. Um, so when you start off a, a pure script project, um, there is this thing called pulp. That's that's what you want to start with, actually. So it's a npm thing. You can just install npm install hyphen g pulp and you will get it. So all that is there in the documentation. I would just want to skip to this. So uh, let me create a new directory. So you create a your script project just like that. Um, it's going to get a whole bunch of things and put it in there. Now, the way pure script is organized is that it uses Bower. Uh, that's one of the other things that I like about the pure script community is that it doesn't like to reinvent its tools. Like for example, Elm has its own Elm package uh, manager. Uh, I mean, every single language has its own package manager. But these guys thought, OK, you know, you have a perfectly good package manager called Bower that's just sitting around. Let me just use that, actually. So they're also very pragmatic. So let me just go ahead and this thing. So this is the main file that we saw. So you just have to run this. So let me do, yeah. It's not visible? Uh, let me do white on. Black on right. Oh, this is even worse. I think it is better, right? Slightly. I'm 
the wrong direction. So, is this better? Slightly, I suppose. Um, okay. So, so let's start doing uh, 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 run this. So, the way you run this is you say pulp run, and it's going to run this, right? And it's going to say hello sailor. I mean, and let's look at the output it produces. So, by default. Uh, it is going to output it in a in a common JS format, so you can actually have this built and check it into npm if you want. Actually, that's pretty cool. So you can see that it is there. So let's try adding a few functions onto this and let's see what happens. Actually, so and it also comes with a REPL actually, so you can run that with pulp PSCI. Uh, PSC is the compiler. PSCI is the it's like just GHC and GHCI from so here you can ask for various things. You can say one plus two. It gives you the. Oops. It doesn't automatically import Prelude. After you have imported Prelude, then it'll. Pre Prelude is the one which has all the standard functions that it comes. Right. So the whole thing about pure script is its types. Um, so usually it has a few primitive types. Integer is one. Um, it has one for floats. It's just number. Um, you can do strings, and you can also do arrays of things. So it says that it's an array of integers. So usually, JavaScript will allow you to do this, but here it will say that you cannot unify. I'm sorry, because it it says that you can't unify, uh, you know, int and a string. That's because it expects all, uh, all the values in an array to be homogeneous, actually. Uh, it also has a record types. So you could do let person equals. So then, so these are just records. So it also supports the standard JavaScript way of building these, but then they automatically get, uh, you know, strongly typed or associated associated with that. Um, and then you can define functions the same way. So you can say square x equals x star x. This way, shouldn't give live demos, and you should have prepared slides. Let me write it here. So let me declare the function here and use it there. Sorry. It takes two ints and it returns another int. 
maybe it was not able to recognize that it is an int. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, so two of them are. Uh, oh yeah. Weird. Sorry. Okay. So you can say square of five and. One second. I think I messed up my REPL pretty well. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, it, it, I mean, so here actually has a particular type uh, which takes a Int and then it returns an int actually. So, as if you see the implementation of this, so let me also do code output. Oh, I didn't build it. Let me build this. Yeah, something weird is happening. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it worked before the. So okay. Uh, so the one thing that I wanted to show you is like when you when you did a pulp build, it actually built in the rest of the functions. When you optimize it, it'll only look for the functions that you need. Say for example, you only got the logs actually, and we had the square function that was there. So it basically ex exports it, and then it, it exports the particular uh, values from the module actually. So as you, even if you have other dependencies on your project, uh, like for example, if you had a lens library or some other library, it'll make sure that it'll only get the libraries that you're interested in, actually. So let's start dealing with records a little bit. Yes, it did, actually. So it has a watcher as well, so you can say, uh, Uh, this will keep watching the directory and then it will keep running it. Um, so ideally speaking, it should, uh, I'm not sure why it's looking for patterns, src star 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 dot js, it should be looking for uh, uh, pure script files. Um, so pulp build should automatically find out that it is looking for the main module and it should build it actually. Uh, but it is not, but however, if I give hyphen O, uh, it finds out the main module and then it's compiling it for some reason. There's, I think it's a small bug that we've run into for some reason actually. Um, anyway, uh, so let's start writing a small, uh, this thing here. So we're gonna do a bunch of records. So we already saw how we do this. So we could say type person is actually um, so we'll keep it simple here. Um, let's go include it in PSCI.
So, so when, when I have this person, right, so I, I could do things like um, it's a And I could say uh, this is a person, m dot person. Okay, but the thing is that, and I would also be able to say a dot first name and a dot last name. But I would not be able to just say a because it'll say that there was no instance found for prelude show main person. That means that. There, is, there are type classes in uh, pure script. So think of type classes as, as uh, what do you say, interfaces in Java or protocols in Clojure, where it says that you need to satisfy certain methods for before it can do this. Now in the console when you're doing this, I mean, or in the, in the REPL when you're doing this, to display a value, it expects it to have the show uh, class implemented. So let's go ahead and implement the class. The thing is that now this is called a synonym type in a sense that Say for example, this this type is the same as a record. So uh, PureScript does not allow you to have, uh, I mean, uh, to do show classes or implement classes on synonym types, right? Because that will create ambiguity. So instead, what it does, you have to do is you have to say this is a new type and give it a type constructor. Actually, then what you can do is you can then say, you can implement an instance of it. And when you are getting it, you just can't have the person object directly. Uh, but you have to understand that this is a, uh, I mean, we have a constructor on this. So you have to say a person of T. And then you can then say, uh, So now we should be able to show the person. So let me do this again. So here now I, I can, instead of doing this, I can do this, say m dot person. Like I said, I already have A, so it won't let me do that. Um, what's wrong? So now it actually displays the name. Otherwise, it wouldn't actually. So if we have to update a particular name, then again, you'll have to set the change name. So you can take a object and you can then say, So you can take an object and say new first name, and hence you could say new first name. So the type of this method would be change name colon colon.
So here, this is the way in which you change the value in a record. So you take the record and then you change uh, whatever value that you have to do and then do this. Now what this does is it creates a new record from that. And since we are using the type constructor, I mean, which is person, it will create a new person class and then return from this. So, so let's see if that works. So this kind of sucks that I have to get back, keep doing this. Um, so you have A and then you say, so this changes. So this is the only way you can do changes in uh, in a record, right? I mean, so every time you have to make a change, so you are always have to make sure that you make this change in place, and then you have to do this. Now imagine if it's a deeply nested data structure. So let's do a, a couple of more iterations on this, then things will become a little interesting. So I'm also going to have a new type called address, and I'm going to have a simple city and uh, uh, state. And let me also add a bunch of phone numbers. So this guy would also have So he also has an address in place uh, with this. And so say for example, now let's also do one more thing. So you would have come across enums, actually. So in uh, in PureScript and Haskell, the way you do enums is called the abstract data type, actually. So here you could do, say, for example, you could have home, mobile, or office, right? So this is sort of, I mean, uh, it's not a simple enum where it's just these type constructors. So it, it could also be specialized on values, so it's home of A or home of B or so on and so forth, actually. So we're going to use this as well. Um, so let's, he's going to have uh, a bunch of phone numbers as well. Something like this. So let's see how we construct such an object. So I'm going to say, A person who is um, address. I'm from Chennai, so uh, state team. No. It's 
not yet there. So, <laughs> uh, and then we'll have some. Uh, I think it will be phone type is going to be here. something like that. Right. So. So we'll fix the show appropriately. So uh, as we he now here, we only have when we show the person, we are only showing the first name, the last name. Uh, uh, we want to show the other things as well. So we'll have to have the instance classes for those. Um, I just. We'll do the same thing for the phone as well. So I'm just going to see if the show method is working on this. we may have to set up a this show class for this as well. So now um, we can say we definitely have a better way of doing this, but I'm just doing this for the sake of simplicity here. Um, so, so and thirteen. The comma. I'm sorry. Uh, I have a comma here, but it says inside. Oh. Uh, between home and uh, okay, yes. Okay. Unknown data constructor home. Choose here. It should. Oh, sorry. Okay, phone type needs a show method on that. So, So one of the ne neat things about uh, this thing is that you can do pattern matching. So you can simply say home
here we call it m dot a person. So, this basically shows that uh, he is the first and last and lives here and so on and so forth. So, the thing that we have to notice here is that when we implemented the show method here, we actually directly did a pattern matching on the constructor itself actually. So, we can do pattern matching on the values actually. So, that is one really cool thing about uh, app, uh, I mean languages like this is that you can actually do partial, both partial and full pattern matching on this, these things. So, the the famous example that's shown is like Fibonacci. Um, yes, so let me, it will be an inexhaustive match and so it should complain actually. It's a good question. No, it doesn't actually, but it will, it will bomb actually. So, let's do that. Um, so, I think instead of commenting this out, let's comment the home thing out. I know Haskell gives an error, but um, it doesn't check for bombs at runtime. Should definitely be a bug. <laughs> yeah, should definitely be a bug. Um, it, I mean, whenever you have these pattern matching things, it should be exhaustive, especially on an ADT. Uh, it's actually quite trivial to find out what the data types are going to be on this one, actually. Yeah, that's a good catch, though. Um, all right. So, now imagine if you have to change. So, we, we did this change name, right? Now imagine if I have to write a function which is actually going to change the number that's there, right? Now that is going to be a pretty hard change function to write if you have to write it like this, actually. So uh, before this, let me, uh, I actually wanted to show you uh, uh, this thing. So you could do, um, I need to get your script list. Um, since it uses Bower, it takes it from the cached things. Um, so, Interesting. So it should have a good function. Right. It has a constructor with an array. Please don't do this. Okay. Um, Okay, so one of the things that I wanted to show is that uh, here uh, it, it actually returns a maybe type even for a head, actually. So some things they've gotten right. Um, uh, like for example, head on uh, head on Haskell would re would actually return a, this thing. And if you give an empty list for a head in Haskell, it would just bomb at runtime, actually. So, but some of those things here have been fixed. So it re actually returns a maybe even on a, a head of a, of a list, actually. So some of those things, but usually uh, you don't want to use list because list is very slow. Array actually maps onto the direct JavaScript array, 
and so it's usually faster actually so i'll get to the constructor it should uh, the cons should just work actually yeah so this would be a Sorry, I think there is an empty list. Uh, there is an empty list, but yeah, I'll, I'll get to this later. Uh, the empty list is supposed to be, I mean, you could just cons on it and just should just work with an empty list, but, hmm? Yeah, there's something wrong. I'll, I'm sorry about that. So, anyway, coming back uh, to this. Now, if you have to change this, this is going to get really difficult really quickly. So, one of the ways in which you do these things is uh, lenses in your script, where you can actually go into a particular data structure and then replace it and then re return back the original value. Um, so I have a, I knew that I would get it wrong when I do it on there, so I spent the last half an hour writing one, so let me uh, probably skip to the repo that I have for this. Uh, this is a very similar sort of structure where you have uh, the person and the address and so on and so forth. Uh, the way uh, this works is that the PureScript lens library uh, uh, allows you to define accessors for a particular structure in your code. Like for example, here I have done this for the first name, right? Uh, the, the first is to destructure on the person data type and actually have a lens which reaches out to the actual function and take it. It's very similar to the uh, lens package uh, in Haskell. Have you, has anybody done lens packages in Haskell? Ed, Edward Smith, you have done that. Oh, okay, so it's it's very similar to that. Um, yeah, but again, there are a few minor changes in that. In in a sense that uh, the the standard STAB uh, type signature still applies, uh, but you have to be very explicit about defining a lens for a here, this thing here. Even though the, you say uh, this person actually takes this record as a this thing, even you declare your lens, you have to specify it again for the, for the type system to understand it. Um, uh, but your standard lens operator still apply. So let me give a quick So I have a vag memory thing here, just like how I had earlier. Uh, so in order to apply a lens, so this is a person, and you can get the first name. So this should, oh sorry.
right? So this will basically reach into it and get the first name. The advantage with this approach is that you could also do changes. So you can lift over this value and uh, I think the operator is. I think I need to get the setter actually. Sorry. I keep forgetting the, I, I'm not sure why they could just call it set. Uh, that would have been easier than these symbols actually. Uh, so you could also set in this. The advantage with this thing is however nested your data structure is, uh, right? I mean, you, you can actually construct these lenses to the particular area, and then you can either set or get objects, and it'll return the whole person object as such, actually. So that's pretty cool. I mean, uh, it's, I mean, a lot of people come to Haskell and it's like, okay, they have these records and all these kind of things, and when, whenever you have to do mutability, it becomes a, uh, or when you want to simulate mutability, it becomes a problem. So with this sort of thing, the, Simulating mutability is not that big of an issue, actually. So going back, so let me give you some of the other things that are nice in the language. Um, so we would have all done, uh, uh, right, I mean, JavaScript Ajax calls, right? And you want to serialize Ajax calls one after the other. Um, so the way you do it in JavaScript is you do promises. So you say this, and then you do a then, and then you give that, and so on and so forth, right? Um, in uh, in a language like PureScript, you don't have to do that, or in a sense that it 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 there's a lot of uh, syntax sugar that lets you go beyond that. Say for example, the uh, there's this thing called the uh, uh, effect monad, and you have the you get you have a way of lifting the effects one after the other, so that you can actually do do some, something like this. Um, so before we do this, let me so let me start the server. Let me show you how this works. So let me run the server. And uh, so let me run this particular thing. So here, what we are doing is. We have a simple call to do a localhost 3000 slash help. And after we get the result, uh, we actually want to log its response, uh, which actually would give back a result. Um, so this, in fact, this would give back a result, which will then be passed to the long function, which will then have an effect where we will actually lift the effect. So lifting the effect is as good as committing that operation. It will wait for the effect to complete. And then it would do the next effect. Actually, so it basically serializes these two values. In fact, you could do something with uh, rest one again. So you, even though it looks like we are actually doing uh, this, so lift f. So I can print that response out again. So, uh, so for people who have uh, done like the bind operator, so what do does is that it actually is a syntactic sugar over uh, multiple nested callbacks. So the rest one basically gets this, the result of it then gets passed to this, the result of it gets passed to this, and so on and so forth actually. So, but because of that, it forms this bunch of closures where the variable less, the rest one is still available here. Although it looks like a, uh, what do you say, a, a a linear flow, like an imperative program, you just say, okay, A equals B, and or A equals one, B equals two, yeah, big deal, A will still be available after you have set B to two. But if you understand how uh, the monadic bind works and how the syntax sugar works, it's actually pretty cool that the effects that you have on top are still available when you have, uh, when you have committed the other effects and they are still available in, sco in scope for you to do interesting things. So let me just um, do this. So okay. it shouldn't be running.
So it gets this help, and then it gets the list, and then it actually prints out the help response again. Actually, the response values is still available after the call gets done. Um, so let me talk a little bit about the server. Uh, it's an ExpressJS server that is being run, uh, and it also has static middleware. So if you go to localhost 3000, um, I have a public facing site. I mean, the, uh, React app. We'll get to the React app shortly. Uh, but if you go to okay, help, so this is what is getting displayed actually. So let's quickly find out how this can be done. So PureScript is not just an academic language. It can actually be used to do both client side and server side applications. So uh, so my earlier idea w was to live code this, but then after I coded this, I decided that's <laughs> not going to be possible actually to do it. Um, so, uh, but let's let's start from the main function. It's usually easier from there, actually. So, uh, you can do multiple levels of foreign function interface in PureScript, actually. Now, the default way of doing FFI is that uh, you do a so you write a standard JS file actually, and then uh, this should be in a common JS module spec, and you should name the module the same as the module that you are going to do that. You need to this comment is sort of important actually for the your script compiler, uh, and then you have to stick whatever functions you want into the exports of that. After which, you write a pure script wrapper for it, and then you do a foreign, foreign import. And if you see here, it is not a standard function, right? I mean, it, it's not like a pure script function where you could carry these values and so on and so forth. Uh, this, is a, this is a function which actually, uh, it's it in fact a special type called fn3 because it takes in three parameters, all the middlewares take three parameters where you have the request response and the next in uh, this thing, right? So you take these three parameters, and that's how you do it. So if you want to add, turn this function again into a curryable sort of function, then you have uh, you have a data dot function package where you can do a run fm3, and then uh, you can turn it into a curryable value, where it actually wraps this particular function into three different uh, functions, where it passes the first value, and then it returns a lambda out, and then write, passes the second value, and so on and so forth. Um, so that's how it works. Now, the other way to do, uh, I mean, that obviously sucks, right? I mean, you have, uh, I mean, when I started doing it, I actually wanted to do a React native your script demo, and I just got lost in writing FFIs, and I gave it up, actually. So it, this is too much FFIs that you have to write to do those things, actually. Uh, instead, uh, what I am using here, uh, uh, what I'm here uh, using here is something called as an easy FFI. It's a library on this. Uh, it's kind of cheating. Like for example, uh, so think of it this way. So I have an array of to-dos actually. So this is our database, um, and then uh, I create a. So for example, if I have to add something to it, I know that uh, pure scripts array is actually JavaScript array, actually. So what I do is like the add function basically takes in to-dos, to-do, and an empty value. And uh, I just uh, do a to do start push to do, and then it gives the index, and I just do a minus one and shows. So uh, this is actually JavaScript code that runs uh, for the to do function. So if you notice here, it is it is actually uh, all, but all these foreign functions have an effect on it actually. So there is nothing which is pure in this because it actually mutates the value of a variable in there. So in the similar sense. Uh, we have a unsafe foreign function, which actually gets the value from process.env.port or 3000. Okay, and this is going to, the the result of it is going to be an effect, uh, which is going to be a string that's going to get lifted and that's going to be in the port now, actually, right? And then uh, we then set up the app on the port actually. Now the app setup is pretty much the same thing that you would be uh, familiar with uh, in this thing. So all you have to do is uh, you use certain middlewares, uh, you map 
uh, routes to handlers, uh, and then uh, on error you do some error handling. So let's let's look at a couple of them. So the easiest thing is of course the help handler that we saw. Um, it has a particular structure like this, and it just displays them into JSON actually. So now we are going to actually turn a, a pure script record into JSON and then give it out. So the way this works, so let's go to help handler. So the help object is a very simple record. So you just create name and bunch of things like this. So it looks like a JavaScript object, but it's actually a pure script record. Uh, and then you have the send JSON. So send JSON method is a part of the uh, 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 this thing, Node Express app. So that knows how to do send JSON, which is essentially JSON of that particular value. Um, it just stringifies the thing and sends it. And uh, that's pretty much what you have to do to actually write a sort of web service in your script, actually. Get the object. It could be the result of a computation, or, a, or and you can lift it from a monad as well. Uh, and then send the value out, actually. Um, so that is how the slash help method works. So let's go to the list method, which is an empty object at the moment. So here, in help, we didn't have to lift an effect. So whatever was the variable, we just did a send JSON on that, actually. Uh, but in this thing, so the handler can also be a monad of this type. Uh, so what this does is it uh, actually does get to do's with indices, which is nothing but a very dirty JavaScript function, which just does a to do dot map, and it's just a FFI again. Uh, so this is like, I mean, of course, your type guarantees with your script are lost, but um, say if you are on a deadline like me and you have to prepare for a talk and show that and still work, you could do something like this <laughs> and get away with. It. Right? So, of course, uh, you could do the same thing with actual pure script records and do it properly. But here, what I did was I basically did a to do start map on it, uh, and then uh, this returns a thing. But the fun part about it is it is an effect, actually. Since it is an effect, um, you can lift the effect into an actual object, which will turn it into a uh, in, into the default value, so which is actually array of uh, array of index to do, actually. So index to do is a type that we have declared on top, which basically says, okay, ID, description, is done, and whatever. So it turns it into an array of index to do, and then it does a send handler. Where did that go? Yeah. And then it does a send JSON on it, actually. So, and that's what you see as an empty array. Um, now the so I haven't included body parser here, so that's why I said get query param. But it is quite simple to include body parser, and then you can do get body param instead of get query param. So you can either deal with it as JSON or as URL encoded form data. Um, so here, here uh, this would be slash create. So this says that it's created, its ID is zero. So if you go to list again, then you should have that value in here. So let's look at what happens there. Um, again, uh, we have a add to do function, uh, which basically has a to do's, and then it has a record onto it. Again, as you would have expected by now, uh, I showed the add to do's function, which is, uh, uh, which is a completely unsafe function. <laughs> I mean, you're not supposed to write your script functions like this. But anyway, so you add to that, you push it, and then when you push it, you get uh, the count of how many items are there in an array. So you just do minus one and do that, actually, so on and so forth. So that that's pretty much what, I mean, the delete, set, done, pretty much all of them are very similar sounding things. So, uh, so that's Pretty much that's all it is to create a web app with uh, this thing. Uh, I will show you a couple of interesting things that happen here. Um, one thing is when I 
go to the actual URL, it actually renders index.html, which comes through the public middleware of that, actually. And also, if you see here, I'm also logging these things here. So whatever URL is visited, I'm logging them, actually. So let's look at how the middleware is done. Um, so, and in fact, we can, so in the setup app, uh, we say use logger and you do these things. So let's go to the logger function. So logger is just a handler. So it gets the original URL. Uh, this is a this is a standard uh, this thing from this uh, from Express app, the PureScript Express library, uh, and then it actually lifts an effect where it actually renders the URL and it calls the next. So both the get your original URL and next are from the PureScript Express libraries, and even there, it's just a bunch of uh, FFIs all, all the way, actually. So in, even in the pure script like space. So that's pretty much it. Uh, you can write your own, and I also, like I said, uh, I use the uh, static middleware. So this is a middleware that's uh, entirely defined in So this is a middleware that's entirely defined in uh, PureScript itself. Uh, the other one is to, if you want to use middleware that is that exists in uh, JavaScript or standard Express middleware, you can just export it as a function, um, get it in via an FFI here, and then uh, instead of saying use, you just say use external, and then point it to the FFI function, actually, middleware that you have. So I think it is, uh, quite usable now. I mean, you can actually start using post, uh, you know, pure script to build server-side apps pretty easily. Uh, and hopefully, uh, you would have time to do a much better job than to just do a unsafe foreign function and do everything that way, actually. Um, so that's, I mean, I meant it as a whirlwind tour of different things. So I wanted to show one more thing, actually. Um, I wanted to show that you can also do pretty decent UI with it. Um, how many of you have worked with Closure Script GNOME here? Or, okay, good, right? I mean, the Closure Script GNOME uh, and L. Anybody? Nobody in L, actually. Okay, so um, L had this idea called Start App. Start App basically said that okay, a, any uh, any purely functional UI. Is going to have these three things. It's going to have a state. It's going to have a action or a bunch of actions which take it from state to state, and then it's going to have a render function, and that's it. Those are the three things. So Ohm also works the same way. I mean, you have the main uh, this thing, and then it keeps rendering it as you move the state. Although the action is not very explicit there, it's just a uh, atom which keeps changing over time. Actually, so the same way in uh, uh, pure script. You have the low level React where you can actually create, do a create class and do things and so on and so forth. Uh, but usually when you are writing or you, when you would like to write a, a, a React applications in pure script, you might want to use a library called Thermite actually. So Thermite does pretty much the same thing. It has this concept of initial state. So, um, and then uh, it, it has a way in which you uh, perform an action or make the state go from or have a way to mutate the state uh, in, a, in a managed way. Um, and then uh, you can then have the render method, which actually takes the state and renders it as such into the DOM. Okay. So let me start with the main method here, uh, which is usually the thing here. So the main method actually has, um, creates a, a spec, I mean takes the spec from here, and it creates a component out of that. Now this is the, uh, I mean, like when you use React, you would have to do a, even if you do this, I think you would have to do a factory of that particular class and then create a factory and pass it to it. Otherwise, if you're using JSX, if you just use the angle brackets, it gets turned into a factory, actually. Um, and then you then use the, you just render it to the body. Now, body here is a method for me, right? I mean, so usually you do window.document.body, uh, but we are in the managed your script world. Uh, window may be available, document may be available, and uh, you may have a 
body on it, right? So you can't just do that. So the way we do it is you actually go to DOM, ask for window. Maybe it will have a window. If you have a window, then you ask, for, I mean, so the, you ask for the document on it. Maybe it will have a document and so on and so forth. Now, actually, this returns a, a either uh, object. So either is like saying whether it is successful or failure. So left is usually failure and right is successful. Um, so you convert it to a, a maybe, and then you do a unsafe just on it. I mean, so so maybe type has these two options. You say maybe it has a value or it has nothing actually. So here again. I am living on the edge, so I, I should actually do a pattern match and do it, or or you can actually bind to it and still get that. Otherwise, you'll get nothing. But instead, what I'm doing here is I'm doing a from just, which will actually, I mean, I'm it'll always be a, I'm always expecting it to have some value. If not, it'll bomb on the client side actually. Uh, from there, uh, I just cre I mean, this is just a helper function because the render method expects. Uh, element and not a HTML element. So you have to turn HTML element to element. So it's just two libraries in the DOM thing which actually changes. So it's just a type helper. And then I call the render method. So the R dot render method is the React's render method, which, which actually gets called. Now our render method is very simple. So you, you get the context, actually. This is the same as the context that you get in Ohm's uh, context. So you have a global coordinator of sorts that actually says, okay, where these components are and what the tree is and all that. So that is the context here. Um, and then you have the state uh, that's here. So state is something that we define, actually. Um, so it's a type that we have. Uh, and it has just one thing right now. It just has a counter of an integer. Uh, I have three actions, increment, decrement, and reset. And I have an initial state where I set it to 0, actually. Um, and then I also have one uh, function which takes a particular action, takes an existing state, and returns a new state, actually. Just like how we did with uh, uh, earlier functions and lenses. Uh, but this is just uses the standard function, because I only have one thing. I could have used lenses, and it would be easier here. So this basically takes a state. And uh, if, the, if it's increment, it increments it, decrements it, decrements it. With reset, I just return the initial state as such and render it. Uh, now the render method uh, actually has, uh, so if you notice here, for some of these I have used underscores. Uh, the reason you use underscores is sometimes you don't care about what the particular types are. Um, like for example, one could be props, another one is the, is the context of the sender here. Uh, if you aren't sure about it or if you don't care about it, you can actually put underscores and your script compiler will kind of figure it out and wing it on its own. So, so here you have these things where this is just like Ohm, where you have um, a, a, a node, uh, its attributes, and the children, actually. They are all in an array. Uh, but it also has these special prime values uh, where it directly takes children and not the, and it doesn't expect attributes on it, actually. So that's the only difference. So here you construct the DOM as you would construct it in Ohm or a similar library. Um, and then you set up properties on it where you say when it's on click, then you basically have a lambda where you apply uh, the action to the context, actually. So here it's increment, decrement, or reset. I mean, you could have other values, like for example, if it, if it has a on click, uh, the on click would actually give you an event object here. So if you want to do something special with the event object, then you can actually lift its effects from there and then also do things from there. So those things would also work. Um, so let me quickly show you how it works. So like standard things. Um, so I actually ha wanted to build a full to-do MVC, both the server side and the client side bits. Um, but as I said, I got stuck with a lot of the FFI issues. So I kind of left it in between. And so I have a React app. I have a small demo which does the um, uh, this thing, I mean, which does the HTTP calls and all that. I also have the HTTP calls, so theoretically it's still possible to integrate, but yeah, when, when I find the time. Um, right. So, in fact, 
this is kind of a whirlwind tour of what um, pure script is capable of. Uh, I, I knew I kind of went a little fast, uh, but if you have any questions or other things, we can take it up now and then we can like kind of discuss if you want to hack on something else uh, on this thing, we can also do that. Any questions or, or Most of the cases, yes, uh, there are few script D3 libraries available, but uh, it, it's still pretty new. Like for example, the new FFI, I mean earlier the way you did FFI before 0.7, so 0.7 got released recently. Uh, in 0.6, still 0.6, the way you did FFI is where you used to write these uh, uh, JavaScript functions as strings within code, actually. Like, I mean like in your pure script code, you would actually have commented, I mean fully stringified versions of the JavaScript function, and then you would say colon, colon, and then have the type on it, actually, which is very weird and very difficult to do it. Now that it has been separated out, I think uh, there will be a lot more FFI in libraries coming up. So yeah, it's, a, it's a fairly new language, but definitely it's worth, uh, worth keeping an eye on, because this brings a kind of rigor to JavaScript that usually does not the JavaScript is not known for. And also, I think this uh, I think this is the best shot at having a strongly typed language both on the server and the client, actually. Uh, I know GHC, JS, and Fay and other things are there, but uh, I think pure script may be the, uh, I mean, in, I would say if there is enough community support behind it, I think pure script would be a clear winner in that space. So let me do one. So exactly, it, 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 precisely the point. You can only use monads when the types are lined up, actually, and that's exactly what it does. So where did it go? Yes. So let's look at the type of this function, right? So as long as the first type, I mean, like as long as the type is the effect, it will be the same, actually. So let me let's inspect the type on this, and we'll be will be slightly clearer. So I won't say a whole lot clearer, but So uh, this type could be a little hard to read. So the thing is that it is of type exception Ajax, right? So as long as it's of type F, it's okay, actually. And you don't have to line it up. So as uh, as you put the stuff in, I mean, so we have lifted the uh, uh, lifted the effects of log. So you don't, you're not seeing that actually. So, but if you had done that, it will actually say affect uh, this exception Ajax console log, actually, all the three of them. So, like for example, So here it will say the uh, the effect does not line up. So the effect is console log here, but the other one is the control monad app effect actually. So which is the which is a different monad, which so you are yeah yeah. So so the types don't line up. When you just say log on it. That's the reason why we are lifting the effect on it so that the the, the, the thing the types line up properly. There. Any 
any other questions if not i am around um, back here i am easy to find so thanks guys